Hey, good morning, and welcome to the Comedy Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club uh, for the month of, this is March, right? Yeah, this is March. Uh, it's the Adult Club, and uh, we've got a really, really, really good, fun book for you this month, and it's Bunt! Uh, you're going you're gonna to really like this one. Um, and we are really happy to be joined by, there they are, there, there they are, <laughs> Mad Rupert. Oh, we lost Ngozi? Oh, for there she goes. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, we'll get her. We'll get her back when we'll get her back. We'll, we'll get her back. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, how are you, Mad? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. No. Thanks. Thanks for so much for being on. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Um, so I always ask the same question to start off the shows, and I because I really like this, and I think it really gets to sort of the core of this. But why comics? Of all the things you could be doing. What is it about comics that speaks to you, that thrills you, that energizes you? Because you do a lot of comics, yeah. uh, and comics are a lot of work. And yeah. so, so why? <laughs> why? Why do I do this to myself? Yeah. Um, I think the answer to that would be, you know, for me at least, uh, comics is the perfect intersection between like writing and art. Uh, which are two things that I have always felt very drawn to. Um, I love telling stories. I love, you know, the the act, the physical act of like making illustrations and everything. Um, most of my stuff is uh, traditional art. Uh, I do do a lot of uh, digital, but um, I've always been sort of a, a an analog first sort of person when it comes to uh, art making. And uh, there she is. And um, uh, I just, uh, to me at least, uh, comics is totally different from both animation and illustration. Illustration, I feel like you spend a lot of time to make one really incredible image. Uh, animation, you draw tons and tons and tons of stuff, you know, to make sort of a short thing. Uh, but for comics, you can sort of pick only the coolest parts to draw to sort of like uh, help you tell like uh, as long or as short uh, an experience as you really feel uh, powerful enough to complete. So um, yeah, I, I think that that's what draws me to the medium specifically. Yeah, nice. Ngozi, the same question to you. Why comics of all the things you could be doing? What What is it about comics that thrills you? Oh, I think our mic's muted. It's this interesting thing where comics like I don't know if Madeline touched on this, but you kind of get a little addicted to making comics because yes. there's this immediacy of like, wow, if I draw this thing and if I draw this thing, like it's immediately there. Like you, you, writing is obviously a lot of fun, but when you're a kid in class and you want to like make a cool action sequence, yeah, you could write about it. But if you draw it on a piece of notebook paper, then whoever is sitting next to you in your fourth grade science class, they're like, whoa, that's so cool. Yeah. How did you draw Goku doing that? And I think that immediacy of connecting with people and the immediacy of just having your storytelling instantly um, recognizable, it also surpa uh, surpasses language barriers. That's just really fun. So I think I had so many stories in my head and I wrote, but it was that instant gratification of showing someone like a comic page that you made on construction paper or wide ruled notebook paper and then like yeah this is cool <laughs> yeah. yeah did that did did has your perspective on comics changed as you did them professionally because professionally you can't do them just on online notebook paper right you know you have to you have Unless to really work you're going it. for yeah. you can you can <laughs> <laughs> So but did that change your perspective on, on that at all? Um, I don't know. And maybe Matt could speak to this too. Like, I really do think that even if you're drawing on notebook paper in class or on an iPad in a cafe or on Bristol board somewhere at your art school, there is that immediacy of like the storytelling hitting you all at once. That's the magic of a comic page. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think... Um... For me, I don't know if the well, certainly uh, doing it professionally does put a lot more pressure on it than um, just, you know, doing it for yourself, for your own self gratification. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, eke a living out of comics. You sort of have to keep 
pulling from so many different places and you know you can't just be a comic artist in uh, most cases you have to be like you know a marketer a self-promoter um uh, a TikTok master, um, <laughs> all kinds of things that really have nothing then to do with the act of making comics. And Gozi is laughing because she's well, I'm laughing at the phrase act, TikTok master. Yeah, because, you, you know, forced me a... at gunpoint to download TikTok on my phone the other day. And I said to Madeline, you will become a TikTok master. You did. You did. Um, and then he went like this while I, while I uh, edited together my first horrible little video. But um I think the coolest thing for me right now, the most, you know, self-gratifying thing about being a professional comic book artist is that I'm finally at a level and I've drawn so many comics that I can uh, take what's in my head finally and translate it like one to one onto the page, which I know is something that a lot of, I think, comic artists struggle with in their first years is like, I've got all these cool ideas, but I have no idea how to draw them, how to write them out, how to, you know, panel uh, or, or, you know, make it all coalesce into uh, an enjoyable comics experience. And I, I do feel pretty adept at that at this point in my career. Yeah. You, um, you've done both serialized comics mad. Uh, you've done web comics, which are a different kind of serialization. Yes, it is. But that's, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's a different rhythm of, of producing. And you've got your first graphic novel here, what are the differences to you between working with sort of those different form factors? Um, well, Ngozi uh, will know exactly what I'm about to say right this moment, which is uh, when you're doing web comics, you're kind of uh, a sicko and uh, you're sicko number one and you are uh, singularly focused on making this story uh, for very little, you know, monetary compensation. It really is, I think one of the last true labors of love that you can do in comics is to continuously make a web comic for yourself that, you know, isn't really, you, you're the only one sort of responsible for monetizing it. But um, when it comes to licensed comics, I feel like it's pretty much the opposite. It's like, you're not really uh, involved in the creation of the characters or the way that they look or really developing the, the voice or anything. Um, what's most important in terms of skill for licensed comics is being able to sort of match the style that's already been established yeah. um, and know enough about the way that it's uh, that it sounds and is written to sort of, um, you know, match that as well. I wrote Andrew, uh, regular show comics, uh, Adventure Time, Steven Universe, all of those. Um, regular show, most of all. Uh, I think I wrote like half of the whole main series for the for the licensed comic yeah um and then for graphic novels it's uh i feel like that's sort of like a more professional but professional in terms of like it's a more structured form to be making comics you know you you have to have the script figured out ahead of time um most times the uh, publisher wants you to have all of the thumbnails done which could be like you know up to 300 pages uh, sure. of thumbnails and then of pencils and then inks. And uh, so it's a much more formalized process uh, and web comics, I would say is like the loosey goosey wild west of like, you can make it however you want. You can update as much as you want. Uh, you can make it as little or as burdensome uh, an effort as you want it to be. Yeah. When you, when you do uh, your web comics, are you, um, are you scripting them? I mean, are you like weeks ahead in your in your head <laughs> of where the strip is, or are you just kind of doing them and putting them up? So for me, I'm in a weird situation because my uh, longest running comic is uh, 14 years long. Yeah, or, or 14, 14 years old at this point. Uh, yeah. I that's one of the reasons I asked. Uh, honestly, just this morning I finished page number uh, 646 uh, at my desk here. Yeah. Um, but because, you know, uh, I was a much different person when I was 20 than I am when I am 34, uh, it sort of has to, I know exactly how it ends, or at least the circumstances of how it ends, so that I always have something to write towards. But um, I kind of take it in chunks, like sort of uh, spur of the moment chunks. I'll only write about uh, six to eight pages at a time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I sort of can you know, figure out like, okay, is this the time 
to bring in this plot point that's been hanging or is this the time to add something new or like find two characters that haven't spoken in a while just to like sort of keep things interesting for myself and for the readers just over that long a period of time and yeah. uh yeah but i mean i i enjoy it it's it's yeah it just seem like it seems like completely different muscles to do something yes. like this than it is to do a webcomic you know yeah and i mean ngozi also uh has sort of uh you've you've kind of uh, would you consider dc comics are sort of like licensed comics right you sort of already oh. have to yeah, absolutely. You're, it's already established. What is, what's, what's your take on that? Well, thanks for asking, Matt. It's. I was about it, to. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I didn't mean <laughs> that. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Expression. It's good. It's purely, good. Purely appreciation. Um, <laughs> No, but I, I really like that question as well, Brian, this difference between making serialized comics for yourself, serialized comics with a publisher, and then just working with a publisher on a graphic novel, because there are subtle differences. And I find that like working on a web comic, it is that pure comics joy of mad, you use the phrase loosey goosey wild west. <laughs> you can you can do anything. You can, you can do anything. This, yeah. You can post as frequently as you want. <laughs> And then you also use the phrase, you can put the burden of yourself, burden on yourself. To like, <laughs> Which, for to me, like, it's yeah. too, too, too much burden that I put on myself. Like, but. you can really burden yourself and be like, I'm going to really go through this entire comic. Um, and post, you can post every day if you wanted. Um, but when you are working with a publisher, um, Working with DC, because I am making graphic novels for DC and I'm not doing floppies, it is slightly different. Um, I think with the graphic novels, making YA, young adult graphic novels for DC, DC Comics, it's still thinking of the entire story, you know, it, there doesn't have to be fighting in every single, like within every 22 or like 30 pages. There doesn't need to be a fight. There should be some fights because it's superheroes. Um, so I can put a little bit more of that like check please spin on it, like some of that YA emotional spin. Um, yeah, because you are a you are beholden to uh, the genre and you're beholden to the IP that you're working with. Like regular show, we know that like the beginning of the story is going to start extremely mundane and then we are going to end in like hell or something yeah. <laughs> like it has I think to go. I, I did write a six mini six issue mini series where they like go to hell yeah yeah yeah, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. i um uh i'm i'm curious and gozy sort of your arc from because the first time we talked you would you would just uh, uh had check please come out as as a graphic novel and you would come off one of the most successful Kickstarters for comics of all time. So I'm, I, I actually would have expected that you kept doing that over and over and over again, right? Uh, and taking the lion's share of money for yourself. And yet you're working with other publishers. Yes. Um, uh, who I'm assuming at least are paying you considerably less. Uh, then, then, then you would have made that way. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm sort of curious about, about yeah. that. What is it? Is it that the Kickstarter took so much energy, or I'm not yeah. going to put words in your mouth. No, that is such a great question. Yeah, now that I've stopped doing Kickstarters, I'm working with those hacks at DC, uh, <laughs> taking all my money. Uh, I'll show them. No, I think it, I cannot speak highly enough of my time at DC, um, particularly working with editor Jim Chadwick and assistant editor Courtney Jordan. Like, I almost cried because Jim actually retired last year. And I like almost cried on my last email to him because he really made like I love DC Comics and he made my experience with DC like just almost like perfect. So I can I won't I just want DC to know I'm not trying to diss them I'm just joking. Um, but I would say there's pros and cons working with a publisher versus working for yourself doing Kickstarters. When you do a Kickstarter, you are basically running your own small business. You become a small business owner. Um, which apparently we help the economy, right? But you are sending out <laughs> stickers. <laughs> you're sending out stickers, you're printing books, you're having things shipped, you're 
dealing with lost orders. It's it, I, I'm a little bit of a speaking of sickos. I'm a little bit of, a bit of a sicko, and I kind of love is. that stuff. I like she is. I love a spreadsheet. I don't know why I'm cracked in the head, but. At a certain point, there's this opportunity cost of, okay, should I be doing all of this manufacturing and shipping, or should I maybe try to focus on story more? But there is also one other factor that I would say is like pro con. Um, you, when you do a Kickstarter and you're working with web comics, you're accessing one audience. Um, people who know about web comics, they might know young people who might know about webtoons, maybe. And that's a pretty robust audience. But when you work with a the publisher, there's an entirely different audience that they can access, particularly for a second, they have a really good relationship with school and libraries. So I remember when I was first working on Check Please, it was, it was fun. Yes, the Kickstarters made lots of money. Um, but it wasn't until a few years later where people would walk up to me and say like, Oh my God, I started reading your comic in middle school because it was in my <laughs> school library, right. which is demented. But <laughs> it's that's a total, you, you, you just can't. Like, I mean, I don't know, can you find Homestuck in like an elementary school library? No, it's not. Well, it, it was printed. Oh, okay. So it was there, printed. There are 12 year olds who have a Homestuck on their syllabus. Probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's one big difference. Yeah. Um, uh, when you guys were starting to put together bunts, what did you, what was your intention for the book? Were you, was it always going to be with Macmillan and for a second or what was the plan? Um, what was the I plan think, in Gozi? <laughs> so, I, so another publisher approached us about working on a story and act, like an actual floppy publisher approached mm. us about working on a story that was kind of like check please but a little bit different so kind of sport sports themed queer themes but maybe with girls instead of boys just a slightly different angle so i started developing that and i immediately was like oh sports Hmm, maybe softball? Ooh, maybe I could work with Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> so Madeline entered the picture pretty quickly. Yeah. And yeah, eventually things did not work out with that publisher, but Madeline and I had developed like this whole pitch. I think by that point we even had character designs. Yeah. Yeah. It, it came together pretty fast. And fast pitch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, once we had this pitch, we took it to for a second. They were extremely enthusiastic about it. And then we started with that. Yeah. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Um, how how much did the book change between the notion of it being serialized as a periodical comic uh, versus it being a self-contained book? Um, I Matt, we had so many... Well, we, we, it's not like we rehauled the story, but... No, I don't yeah. think... I think it was more just, like, a, a big idea. I don't know if we ever formally cut it up into, like, six issues or anything like that. I think it was always just, like... It It, it switched. We, we took it somewhere else before we really had to um, figure out a way to tell it in so many small issues. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think, pretty much from the get-go. It felt more like a, a graphic novel like a one shot graphic novel than um than like an, a serialized uh story although i feel like we had plenty of material that we could have sort of continued it indefinitely if we really wanted to but mm. i think you know both of us are, are busy people <laughs> so yeah. we're like it was well, actually was was that your was original saying. idea that it would be like an ongoing book rather than a particular yeah it was supposed to be a six issue series uh -huh. with this publisher. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it had been because we, Madeline and I had so much material, it could have been eight issues, 10 issues. Yeah. And this graphic novel could have been a lot longer. Yeah. We, we probably could have stretched it out to two if we had really wanted to, yeah. but that wasn't really, <laughs> at the time we were both like, let's try this. And you know, as is the nature of graphic novels, uh, it, uh, got delayed. Both of us got busy and overburdened with other work. And um, so, you know, yeah, in the end, it was like, we need to finish this this graphic novel, this single graphic novel, and then 
figure out what happens next. Sure. Yeah, I haven't I haven't gone through and counted the pages, but you do have you know clear chapter one and uh, it, they feel like they're somewhere between twenty and thirty pages uh, a section, so they're more or less around what an issue would be. Um, I was just sort of wondering about the structural part of that because, you know, the, sometimes when you, sometimes when you do a pitch, you, you've, you've got the whole breakdown, you know, whereas other times it's just, here's, here's the loosey goosey idea. Which, oh. which direction you muted yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was just saying the word loosey goosey again. Um, <laughs> yeah. I do remember in the outline. Oh, <laughs> Oh, this, this is the theme. Oh, this is the theme. You moved oh, yeah. very quickly. Uh, I didn't know. Wait, uh, what was I going to say? Yes. Uh, I think when I was initially writing the story, um, I broke it down into those chapters. But um, I, I don't think we, like, we definitely played around with it a lot. Towards the end, it became a lot more like, if if this chapter needed another beat, let's add it. If it didn't. We didn't, yeah, we weren't too beholden to the outline. Yeah, there, there were some significant changes to the outline, even like, you know, in the 11th hour. Uh, I think, you know, on the final round of edits, I was like, wait, 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 there's still things that need to be, we can't go to print like this. But um, that was, that was, that uh, put the fear of God in me. But um, uh, other than that, yeah, it was um, because it's sort of a, we had like a timeline for Bunt that was like, it's supposed to take like two years and it wound up taking, you know, some extra time beyond that. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, there were definitely, we had the opportunity to look back at what had been written, had been written and be like, I think this could be improved. I think these character relationships could be sort of, uh, quantified a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, we can put a little more substance in places, uh, there were parts in the script that were just say uh, Madeline put like four pages of softball here. I trust you. <laughs> this story would not exist without Madeline's softball expertise. Yes, I did play a uh, competitive fast pitch softball for about ten years. Nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's that, and then you also have just the ability to draw a lot of fun action. So like, you, like all of your skills and experiences coming Thank into you. one. Thank you. Yes. All the things that I like to do, uh, draw action, uh, think about action, make comic books. Uh, I did not actually like playing softball all that much. But I should, I oh. should mention that. <laughs> and you know, I would say that in our revisions, like there's a character named Susanna. I remember in the first drafts, I had her as this really serious, like like social justice politically minded character and that was fun and all but then in the revisions we're like we just need to make her like like criminally stupid yeah uh, just like a very strong himbo she's girl, girl himbo yeah she's a girl himbo just like a jock yeah. and yeah it made more sense because molly is more of a nerd and and she's the more like socially minded character so that they can play off of each other um yeah, and if anything, like now that I've read Bunt a few times, I'm like, hmm, I don't know. I, I won't talk about the changes I would make, but <laughs> I think I would just make it even more fun. I'd be, I'd take out some stuff. Oh, it was more plenty food. fun though. Don't. Yeah. yeah, it was. That was a very fun book. Um, uh, did you guys plot this together? I mean, how did the how did sort of the outline part of it go? I'll I'll jump. I think I, I did a lot of the plotting. Yeah. I think every action scene, every every game that was Madeline figuring out the beats of that, I kind of knew what the outcome of the games um, needed to be and like the stakes of the games going in. But yeah, I, I in my head, I kind of tend to overthink things. <laughs> is that an understatement? But in my head, I was like, this is a heist movie. I'm going to watch Ocean's Eleven, like original and remake. I'm going to get the extract the beat, the story beats from Ocean 11 and then put them into bond just like like a mad scientist taking the brain out of a pig and putting it into a, <laughs> a goose. I just finished watching Poor Things. 
<laughs> I, I love that movie. That's know, a great yeah, movie. Yeah. So literally I watched Ocean's Eleven and I was like, I'm going to take Ocean's Eleven and just put it into our YA sports novel. So... <laughs> Yeah, you have uh, you have a lot of characters there yes. uh, in the book, obviously because it's a whole team. Was it a challenge for you to find an arc for each one and to give each of them something to do that's substantive, and yet move the narrative along in a way? Because in Check Please, most of the team didn't actually really interact, other than just sort of being background characters. Yeah, at Check Plays, there's 22, there's 22 people on a hockey team usually, and there's like only five characters <laughs> to say anything. Yeah. But I know me and Madeline, we had to like, in our revisions, there was a few, there was a few characters who were talking way too much, doing in every single scene, and they weren't like the protagonists or... They're our favorites though. <laughs> yeah, so we had to like cut back on characters and spread the spread the love around a bit yeah. more. Yeah, sort of like uh, dull out the, the scenes a little more equitably. <laughs> Yeah. between all the characters i think um yeah i, I think mm, when when you read bunt after having read a lot of web comics you can sort of see both in gozi and i's uh journey through web comics to bunt mm -hmm. i feel like uh the characters uh, so yeah like sometimes in a web comic like the the fandom of a specific web comic will take very little substance for a character like a character can like show up and like say two things and then like walk out of the scene and you don't see him again for like 50 pages and uh, but the fandom will like grab that be like this is my guy now <laughs> so i think both of us sort of like we we have this understanding of like what can be done with just a little bit uh, in terms of like a large cast of characters so it sort of becomes more like what could what is something like substantial and funny and endearing that this character can do like right away when they come into the scene so that that can sort of give you an immediate idea of who they are what they're about why you should like them and then sort of like just let them be there for the rest of the comic but th they don't necessarily have to be participating in every single scene that's a really good point because I do, I, I just realized with web comics, that's not a problem. I've never yeah. heard someone like a web comic reader go like, oh, there's too many characters in this. They're yeah. all like, nope, give me more. Yeah. Even, even that one guy in the background who's just like a, a dot with a smile, like that's my character. <laughs> who's that I'm, guy? Yeah. I'm going to write my a guy. fiction about this guy and dress up as him. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas exactly. like. Uh, I'll just say, like, pedestrians, civilians, when they read a webcomic, they're just like, what's going on? It's like, we can't understand that every character could be someone's entire personality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a very different, it's a very different relationship in how you read it, too, as a reader. Uh, you know, knowing that the, this is the boundary of the book and that this is everything that there is and it's mm -hmm. all contained within that versus a webcomic it maybe doesn't even have a it has a beginning but and a middle but maybe it never has an end you know yeah. exactly. um, and also in the lifetime of a comic maybe you will go 10 years without seeing a character but you know he's there in, yeah. <laughs> in my case and he could show up at any time, any time yeah. yeah there are characters we haven't actually actively I have not actively been drawing for maybe uh, eight years, but they're coming back in the next scene. Is, I actually love this conversation because I didn't realize how much of our webcomic um, tendencies and our uh, uh, tastes showed up in Bun. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's good though. Um, I, I'm curious, you were talking about needing to do a lot of revisions uh, towards the end of the project. How much actual redrawing did you have to do, Mad? Um, actually, not not that much redrawing. It was uh, the 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 eleventh hour. Like, oh my god, I'm so glad I caught that. Was really just like um, a, a character in the final, or like a a, a, a an enemy character, uh, one of the other players <laughs> that just popped into my, one of the enemies. <laughs> it's the ball. 
anyways and uh it's a pop-up uh and somebody catches it in the outfield but um then in like the next panel she's like still running the bases and i was like oh wait a minute i can't believe nobody caught that uh she should be out it should be a different character a different enemy <laughs> i'm sorry I'm, yeah i'm losing it because you call another college student like an enemy an enemy yeah an enemy player an enemy player uh, uh my partner was just playing uh dragon's dogma on the uh on our tv and i was like oh the enemies <laughs> you're fighting the sorry <laughs> yeah i don't know why that tickled me so much so was like... uh, uh yeah um Ngozi, you went to Yale, I know. Uh, Mad, where did you go to school? Or did you go to school for comics? Yes, I went to uh, the Savannah College of Art and Design for my uh, BFA and my MFA. Okay. Uh, and that is how uh, Ngozi and I met, was uh, at, in the grad program at SCAD. Nice. For, uh, for sequential art. Yeah. Maybe we could even talk about how we first met. Yes, we could. We could tell our origin story. Let's <laughs> let's hear it. I would love to. I, I love a good origin story. I want yes. a comic book story. Ah uh, yes. Well, it's an enemies to friends en to lovers. To lovers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not lovers. Um, <laughs> I just so it was so so yes. I did Yale for my undergrad, but I was overly ambitious. Immediately after college, I decided I wanted to learn how to draw better. So I applied to go to SCAD. And I was so concerned with like scholarships, and I didn't want to pay for SCAD. And I heard about this, like graduate student scholarship that they would give to some people. And I knew that only one person had it, I wanted it. But I know that only one person had it and that their name was Madeline Rupert. And Madeline was not in any of our intro classes because apparently they were like too good for that. Like like she was, um, she had like drawn for like, started drawing for like Boom Comics and you know, had already done SCAD undergrad. So I was just like, okay, who the heck is this? They can't be that great. And I do literally remember Googling Sakana and looking at the pages and then just knowing like, oh yeah, okay, never mind. <laughs> Madeline deserves not only the scholarship, but she should not be anywhere near me. <laughs> like, no. You already knew how to draw. You knew very well, well your inking yeah. was excellent. And then we had our, um, we were paired together for our first, uh, my first semester. It was like a drawing course and you were in a writing course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was um, it was the foundations of sequential art, which is you were in, and I was in the um, scripting for sequential art, like the grad version of that. Uh, and so one of the first projects that you did in that class was the scripting. People would write like a short script, and then give it to somebody in the foundations class to draw a few pages as like a way to like meet your classmates and everything. And um, uh the thing that you should know about my that that semester at scad uh is that i got uh this horrible case of bronchitis i had never been sicker in my entire life i was ill for about i think like about two months at that point um and at scad you can only miss four classes per semester and then on the fifth one you fail the class wow. so i had already used up my four classes already so uh, i was like dragging myself into class basically every single class period and um so the script that i wrote was not very good yes. and um and Gozi got it uh, ahead of time and uh, i got an email from a, a name that i had never seen before it's in Gozi yukazu it was like i have some notes on your script <laughs> which was not part of the class you weren't which is not part of the anybody. class and um that i did not annoying i did not respond to her good <laughs> So then we finally got to the class, uh, and um, I was I was very ill. I was very tired. Uh, I didn't have glasses, so I uh, squinted all the time. So I was looking at her like like this, um, and uh, yeah. So uh, they called our names, and Ngozi stood up to present, and uh, she's like, "Here are the pages. Uh, I had some notes," and I was just like, Bam. <laughs> "Yeah, <laughs> just." I was not that upset. I, I honestly didn't care that much, but like, 
I think the, the, the look that I gave you made you think that there yeah. was some deep you just, animosity. You turned around and you were like, I, you didn't say it, but it just felt like you were like, shut the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh no. But you know what? It all turned out well. And then a few yeah. years later, Gozi was a bridesmaid in my wedding. Yeah, so we, that's how we it became all, friends. We, we became Very great nice. friends. Were they, uh, were, were they good notes at least? Probably not. Uh, no, no, I think they were. I think they were perfectly. It was not a good script. I think the the funny part was that it was like the classes like didn't really matter. The assignment didn't really matter. But Ngozi was like, I have notes. <laughs> I was again. It was the thing of me being like, oh, let me do. Let me just be extra. Like no one. I wasn't supposed to do any of that stuff. It was. I was annoying. <laughs> it was great. It was great. It, it it showed me that you cared. You cared about comics. <laughs> nice. And then nice. we fell in love. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> TK. TK. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it took you guys quite a while, though, to, to collaborate on, on a book, though. Yeah. I mean, we had to go through all of grad school, and I think about two years out of grad school was when we started talking about Bunt. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, I always forget if it was 17 or 18. I think it was 17, 17 2017. 2017. And we graduated like 2016 or something. Yeah. So, so it was like, you know, some time to sort of yeah. reset after school and everything. Uh, I moved, um, everything like that. And then, yeah, around like 2017, Gozi was like, hey, you want to do this? And I was like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so literally years in the making. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, years in the making. Yeah, from that very first script. And <laughs> and now it was my turn to say, I have notes on this. <laughs> no. It's hero's journey. <laughs> hero's journey. <laughs> uh, no, but it was great. I um, I wonder, Ngozi, what, um, what the difference to you is uh, for working on your own script that you're going to illustrate yourself versus writing a script for somebody else to draw is it is it a change of mind is it absolutely so i was actually in minnesota last week teaching a, a workshop on writing comic scripts just like an introductory workshop for prose writers and just to introduce them to the concept and I was talking about how my scripts have changed over time and how they change based off whether I'm writing for myself to sh and to show an editor or if I'm writing for someone else. Writing with Madeline was the first time that I was writing a script for someone else. And I learned so much because when I'm writing a, when I was writing the scripts for Check Please, it was mostly dialogue and I would be able to cut up the panels in my head and I would thumbnail and like make dozens of revisions it just in my head while I was thumbnailing. When I was writing for Madeline, it was learning like, hey, actually, you can't put this many panels on a page. Hey, actually, characters can't do two actions in one panel. Hey, all this stuff that you would figure out while thumbnailing, you can't just have Matt like, do these impossible tasks. So like, Matt, you were very helpful in giving me feedback and helping me learn how to really write scripts for others. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the two of us really trusted each other, you know, because we, you know, had just gone through all of grad school together. We both are very familiar with each other's work and everything. So, yeah, I feel like you trusted me to, you know, say, oh, we should spread this out or we can cut this and everything. And I trusted you to, you know, put together a, a good story that was engaging that, you know, we could sort of massage a little bit together in some places uh, to really get the, the best out of it. And um, yeah, I, I don't really feel like yeah, you always sound so sorry. When I always I mean, I apologize for the rest of my life, but you I always think, are so forgiving. I think that, no, I think that there was no doubt in my mind that the two of us together would like figure out something that was good and, and entertaining. So it was more of a, a situation of every once in a while I'd be reading a page and I was like, this could be three pages. <laughs> and but, I, I feel like we should take this show on the road because I think we could talk a lot about like successful artistic collaboration. Yeah, 
I think so. I think, yeah, I I feel like I have a, a an inflated sense of what it is to collaborate with people. Because, uh, you know, they say, oh, never, never work with your friends. But I feel like we only had, like, the best possible experience. There was, like, zero friction. <laughs> Nice, nice. I um, I'm intrigued by the thing you said, Ngozi, about. I, I understood that you can't put that many panels on the page because, in again, in your head, you're self editing that as as you're breaking it down for yourself. But the you can't show two actions in a panel. Yeah. I would have thought that that would have just intuitively uh -huh. been an intuitive lesson. Uh huh. You'd, you'd think that after making like hundreds of comics pages, I would know that when writing a script. But I think it's just the subtle details of like, um, okay, if I'm writing that Eric Biddle, you know, gets up to leave, gets up out of his chair to leave a room, maybe I could like somehow figure out like him touching a chair as he's getting up from it or leaving it. But that doesn't, that's not really clear. And that's not as, as, you can have clearer action in that. Like you can just show like the character walking out of the room or the character like standing up. So I think that in my mind, I would come up with these actions. And, and, and we talked about that too, Madeline, you really prioritize clarity in your work. Yeah. And I think that sometimes with the way I write, I can some, I could um, circumvent clarities just so I can make an action work. So, yeah, I think for you, you would look at a script like that and be like, I'm just going to draw this in the clearest way possible. Yeah, I, I definitely think that that's sort of my singular goal is to, you know, make actions and uh, setting and, you know, characters within environment as clear and understandable as possible. Um, and certainly, you know, anybody who's made a lot of comics has a way that it all plays out in their head like it's like your fingerprints it's like the yeah. way that i panel and think about laying down panels uh will be totally different from the way that ngozi would automatically think how to how to do it you could even you'd say eric biddle leaves the room and i bet you the two of us would take that and draw it into uh completely different ways yeah and uh, so yeah that's why i say i think that it was we both trusted each other just I, I trusted you to sort of like, you know, make an engaging scene and you trusted me to sort of interpret it in a way that, you know, prioritized clarity and, um, you know, was, you know, entertaining to look at. Well, I guess this this might be the next question for you then, Matt, is when you got that initial script where it had things that you went, this needs to be three pages. Did you did you write back? You yeah. just you just you just <laughs> drew it. You just drew it yourself and, and went, this is this is what we're going for. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. I did. I did. Well, but you know, uh, I would I would submit my thumbnails and everything. Uh, yeah. but then eventually it was like, oh well, we're really over time, so I'm just gonna draw it and not submit the thumbnail. I'm but. glad you did. I don't know. I think one phrase that I tell students is you know, collaborators, not villains, not yeah. enemies, not enemy players, <laughs> not enemy players. Like, I don't I guess I do just trust Madeline's skill so much that like, not even nine times out of 10, like 10 times out of 10, if you're redrawing something, it's because it needs to make more sense. I don't know. Yeah. Or not even that it needs to make more sense. It's just I have an idea in my mm -hmm. head of like how I think that this should look and you trust me to, mm -hmm. you know, make it look good. <laughs> Yeah. So as a mechanical process, Mad, when you get a script, what's the first thing you do with that script Ooh, to envision it into becoming, because you have a blank piece of paper in front of you yeah. and you've got some words over here. So, mm -hmm. so how do you translate the words onto the blank piece of paper? If that made sense as a question. No, it does. Um, I think my, my honest answer is that I spend like, five minutes staring into space, just like into the middle distance, like trying to envision how all of these actions will sort of translate to individual panels, what the size of the panels should be, uh, how the page should be laid out. Yeah. And then usually first I'll, if I'm doing like a little tiny thumbnail or something, I'll just draw out the like panel separations 
and then start filling in. So if I know that there's supposed to be like five panels on a page, I'll sort of envision it and then I'll draw five, you know, panels or like like the, the borders for the panels and then I'll start yeah. filling in like the art after that. Um, but really, yeah, the, my first uh, instinct is to cut it up into different sizes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, when, when I say it out like that, it's, yeah, it's I'm trying to figure out the panels and the yeah. panel sizes first and foremost before I even really think of the action. Or even, uh, I'm sorry, I keep. No, like, that makes total no, no, sense. No, no, no. This, this, is, this is actually really great. Because <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I ask this head. question, I ask this question of a lot of people, and everybody has a completely different method of doing it, mm -hmm. which is one of the things I like the best about cartoonists and talking to them, because there's no, there's no right way to do it, you yeah, know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, everybody's got their own unique uh, yeah. uh, uh, movie playing in their head when yeah. they're sort of envisioning how it should all be. And I don't know, to kind of speak more to Madeline's thought process, like I was just doing, um, uh, I was doing some work for DC and you were at my house at the time and you yes. gave me so much feedback on those pages and a lot of it was just like composition, clarity. Tangents. Um, tangents, it was mostly <laughs> tangents. But I was, I don't know, I was, it was interesting to see how you, how you think, I mean, maybe it was just mostly tangents, but it was still easy. It was like cool to see you think about other people's pages and what you see. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really amazing, uh, uh, just, uh, thought experiment is to take, even take like five pages that you are like happy with and show them to another comic book artist and say, you know, critique this. How would you do it differently? You know, what do you see that you would change? And, you know, it's not necessarily the, the right or wrong answer, but, um, it, you know, it could, like I said, it could be completely different. Everybody's sort of got this idea of how it should be, you know, what the order of operation should be. Uh, and I think that that's, yeah, really amazing. Just to, and I mean, you know, Ngozi, your pages already looked fantastic and had like a lot of detail. All I was saying was just like move everybody away from the panel borders <laughs> a little mm -hmm. bit. And you redrew a monster, which I appreciated. I do like to draw monsters. Yeah. That that was a specific uh, uh, a thing that I like to do. So I will yeah. take credit for that. That was awesome. <laughs> so it sounds to me, Mad, that you're you're most often thinking about how space sits on a page and how it flows in the page. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. think that that's, that's important. Um, I uh, like to pay special attention to backgrounds and uh, setting as well. I think that um, there's nothing, no offense to anybody who does this, but there's nothing worse than like two talking heads over and over and over again. You never ever, see, you only like see them like here up every single panel. Um, there's like no indication of like where they are in space, what's happening around them. Uh, you know, if they're in like a coffee shop, let's say the setting is a coffee shop. It's like, are there other customers there? Are they moving around? How big is the coffee shop? You know, what's happening outside the coffee shop? Could we have a panel that's like looking through the windows at them? Um, uh, actually, uh, I've given, what was that? I was going to say, everyone should Google uh, five pages, five, oh, yeah. like five panels, I, five pages by I, Madeline Rupert. I do have a five and five algorithm that I created uh, that's uh, that I've given to like 10 different classes at this point, which is like, uh, uh, I share it with two. Yeah. It's like within every five pages, I want to see like one huge establishing shot. Let me see if I can remember all of them off the top of my head. There's one huge establishing shot per five pages. There's two, like, is it, is that the weird kit? No, it's yeah. Two, no, it's weird angle too. Weird angles. Mm -hmm. So like uh, the we either get like a worm's eye view or a bird's eye view, or some sort of like not just straight on. Yep. And then three is feet. Three feet. You have to see their feet at some point. Either it's full body or you just sort of like crop them in a different way so that we see the bottom half. Uh, for some reason, just you know. Uh, and then I think it's four. Uh, I feel, like, that, 
I oh, literally just taught your, I ah. you made this whole sheet and I taught it to some to class. It's detailed <laughs> backgrounds and hands. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So then, yeah, for uh, like, I would say half backgrounds, just like to remind us where we are and like, is anything changing? Are they moving through the space? And then five, um, like hands, like. I always think that even if you just have a picture, which is why I keep putting my hands up like this to to gestures, because I feel like um, even if it's just a panel where the, it's just the face talking, like if they have their hand doing something or some sort of like secondary action, it's like more interesting than just like them speaking. And that's my that's my five and five rule. Yeah, I like it. Do you um do you have like a like a mirror there in your studio that you're that you're looking over to 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 do that kind of stuff with, or are you just building it in your head? I think I just I just build it in my head. Um, mm -hmm. I just uh uh like I said, it's uh composition and flow. I think is what I'm most interested in. And if I see just a head, I'm like, would a hand just like up here or something improve the flow or the interest? Mm -hmm in that panel so these are all like i feel like i'm like checking or checking things off of lists while i'm sort of uh determining what i should be drawing it's like is there flow are there hands should there be hands can i zoom out can i zoom in can i uh move the camera in some other way so it's yeah it's sort of now, like, a, it's you, like, like a video you, game <laughs> do you do you work with um uh, when you do your thumbnails, are, do you thumbnail the individual page or are you thumbnailing double two pages at a time so you can see where the left and the right are? I usually do. Actually, I'm, I'm going to ruin everything I just said and say I just do single pages one okay. at a time. I think that I always have these uh, grand ideas of doing two pages at once so I can really check the flow you know, between yeah. – page a and page b yeah. but then i usually start doing so many revisions on the same page within the same sheet of paper that i then have to take the second page to the next you know sheet in my sketchbook and start working on it there so it's more of a i don't know there's so many edits happening right there on top of it that uh, i need more space sure sure how how much do you think about the page turn then uh, I think, I don't think that much about the page turn. I think that sometimes uh, it's easy to sort of see when a page turn abso absolutely should get like a, a a big reaction. But most of the time, I think it's because I've done so many web comics. I'm like, mm. each page is a page turn. Right, so right, 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 right. That's, that's infecting my brain. Right. Um. When you're what I just out of curiosity because I I didn't go and look at your particular uh, uh, Sakana, uh, you're doing you're doing strip Strips. style though, yeah, right. Yes. So so your your last panel is always it's a little a little bit different than a than a yes, it's a absolutely yeah absolutely different. I'm I regret for the last decade and a half having <laughs> uh, uh, so it started as a class project when i was an undergrad which is why it had to be comic strips that was like the format that we were supposed yeah. to draw in uh and i've just continued it on my own all of this time all of these years yeah. but um nowadays it's just like it's a little difficult to print you know i have to print like big landscape books uh whenever i do kickstarters for um the collected volumes and now I have this crazy idea that I'm going to cut up all 600 pages into like webtoons format right. and like for scroll. So we'll see. I'm going to yeah. start on that. <laughs> neat. Oh, that's very neat. Uh, and Gozi, let me ask you the same question uh, uh, in terms of laying out a page and thinking about like, do you think about page turns? Do you work two pages against each other so you can see your left and right? I mean, I would especially think with 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 like DC comics, yeah. superhero comics, you you kind of have to think about the action in a greater way than you than you maybe do natively. Yes, I I think that I don't always think about pages at, like right next to each other, but I now started thinking about the page turn, especially because a hallmark of superhero comics is the splash page. So, like when one character find when the hero finally gets to like punch out the villain or 
when we see someone get like super stabbed, someone get super stabbed by like a cosmic knife, you want that to really have impact. So I will, um, I will make sure that like I'll even spread out some action or condense some action so that the reader can get the page turn. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. I love it. I, you know, like I say, everybody's got a slightly different way of thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I've told the story a couple of times, but, but my, almost my favorite interview so far has been with, um, I think she's from the Netherlands, uh, an artist by the name of, of, uh, Anne Fermark. And the way that she does her work blew my mind. She, she does the colors first before she draws a single line. And she says that she does that to create the emotional mood for the page. I can see that. And then she starts drawing after she's got the colors down. And I'm like, doesn't that mean that you end up throwing away like every fifth page? And she's like, way more than that, you know? But which is kind of crazy. Like she starts working on something. It's like, oh, nope, that's just not working. Chuck in the garbage. You, I mean, you, know. you can see our faces. We're like, yeah, yeah, I can see faces. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like starting with the lettering. It's like, yeah. But don't we? Don't we, the character's mouths might be in different places. Yes. Uh, no, I think, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, it's cool. I, I understand. Ways. I understand. Sometimes you have been making comics a certain way for so long that it's like almost like a ritual that you have to go through to like, you know, finish a comic page. And for this person, I could imagine that it would be like, they are fine with throwing away every like, three or four pages just because that allows them to like understand with extreme clarity how the first page will will you know turn out i've definitely said to myself many times like why am i doing this like this like in traditional art um i take like so many great pains to like never ever make a mistake on the page when i'm doing it traditionally and it's like why do i care i can just edit it in photoshop what does that, what does it matter? No one will know. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah no, it's, 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 it's fascinating to me. I, I'm utterly fascinated. Um, okay, so uh, let's, let's maybe talk about the book a little bit more. Um, uh, where did the initial idea come from? Oh my gosh. I think the initial idea was the, like a publisher reaching out and saying, oh, can you make okay. a sports story? <laughs> I wish it was more profound. Like I was, Make check please with girls. Yeah, make, make check please with girls. Yeah, I wish it was more like I was walking through Forsyth Park and I saw a softball. It landed near me, but it was literally <laughs> like, "Okay, can you make check please with some girlies?" And so, did you kind of reverse engineer that idea into the characters? A, a little bit, a little bit. It was, and it's funny because the character Molly, who is on the cover there with her green hair and glasses, she is. She, I mean, it's like no surprise. She is basically me, just a type A black girl who cares way too much and tries way too hard. Um, so I did reverse engineer a little bit, but a lot of it was like, okay, if this story needs an engine, I'm gonna have to, you know, cut out a little part of myself and just stick it into the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, how much? Uh, how much is? based on your guys' own experiences and anecdotes at SCAD versus the art school experience in general, I suppose? Well, the specific is the universal. Um, I would say, I think like 99% of anything that has to do with art school is just something me and Matt encountered. Like it's so much of it. Yeah. Yeah. Including the characters too. Yeah. yeah. Although they are not one to one based on anybody that we know. We they are absolutely, one-to-one. absolutely. Say for legal purposes. <laughs> yeah. legal purposes. No, I was I was actually I was actually thinking more about the school parts of it, honestly. Oh. Uh, yeah. because you know, there's um there's a certain amount of bitterness um that's that <laughs> I'm gonna put that on in Gozi. <laughs> I think the bitterness comes towards uh, institutions, I think, are a lot like people, and pow- powerful institutions are like powerful people. You acquire that much power. It's very hard to acquire power in a moral and ethical way. And yeah. I, it's funny because, like, 
I mean, like I love DC comics and I love like my undergrad and those are all very large institutions with fraught histories. But I think that for art school, there was a little bit of bitterness towards the idea of acquiring power through other people's creativity, uh, acquiring power through the passion of young people who may not know any better. And I wanted to really lay out how a character who can start off being extremely passionate about um, an institution, how they can kind of learn more about it and become a little bit disillusioned, but not lose their hope and their optimism towards other people. Sure. And yeah, it's funny, like, I, I don't know, it's, it, I, I don't think of myself as a better person, but writing Blunt was a little bit of an exorcism of, of that experience. You, yeah. You're not bitter, but, but you remember. I'll never forget. You remember. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, it bitter may not even be the right word. I no, just, it's the right word. You know, it's, it's <laughs> because I mean, I certainly, I certainly never went to to art school. But living in San Francisco, we have kind of a similar relationship as a city with the Academy of Art, right? And the Academy of Art, like buying up all these properties, and then you hear stories from students how you know, they're, they're being forced to pay exorbitant rents to the school, like, which is not what the school's mission is supposed to be. Yeah. You know, like, so I like know a lot of that kind of stuff. And I mean, I, I really felt that in this book, not those specific things, but, but that kind of, um, that kind of friction between what the school needs to do to make as much money as it possibly can versus serving the students and you would think that serving the students should be their primary goal but that's not actually the case in most cases hey brian you said it not me <laughs> <laughs> creating Very value good. for shareholders of course yeah uh-huh 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 <laughs> yeah yeah no and and you know i mean it's it's interesting when you when you kind of apply those same thoughts to any kind of place where, where where the business interferes with, not interferes with the art but changes the art or does something with the art you know at any publisher be it a big guy like DC Comics or a smaller company like Boom they're making choices that are not inherently in the best interest of the artists or the art necessarily you know um and it's Certainly frustrating from my side of the counter, someone who doesn't make these things, you know, yeah. who just wants to sell the best art that I can. Like, oh, but if only you had done it this way, it would all be so much better for everybody. And then, you know, then, then you learn that that's not how actually the world works. Yeah. Yeah. I've had good experiences with DC. Oh, of course. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't trying to suggest <laughs> otherwise, or I wasn't trying to get anybody to tell tales. That, that was no. not... That was not why I went on that little rant. It was just, it lives in my head too. I'm just saying, of as course. a comic book retailer, yeah. I, I, I have these same problems of friction with, uh, yes. with, with the, uh, the caretakers, you know? Yes, it's part of life. Uh, as individuals, we always in interact with organizations and institutions. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Okay. All right. We'll tie that one up and put it away. Um, Good. Uh, okay, so so physical craft of the book, Ngozi, you're writing a script. It sounded to me, maybe I'm wrong, that you're not writing a full script with panel by panel. You're just you're writing a kind of an outline, a screenplayish outline. I would say most of it. I did outline it, and then most of it was scripted. But when it came to the softball parts, I kind of handed those to Madeline. Those are there, like loose. There outlines. was a note. There was a note. So Madeline, uh -huh. figure it out. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> please. Uh -huh. Got those. Please. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and then Mads, you start breaking it down. You have so you had to do thumbnails for the entire book before you could start drawing it, or or partial. So they wanted the entire thing done yeah. first they wanted the whole script and then all of the thumbnails and it was just it was difficult for me to work like that so i sort of brute forced like i'll do like 20 to 50 pages at a time and like thumbnail them and then pencil them and then ink them 
Um, but, uh, and I mean, you know, you went through all the stages and batches then. Yes. Yeah. In, in like big batches, but then, you know, by the time we got to the end, it was like some of the first pages needed, you know, to be brought back up to style because, uh, character designs had sort of been more formed towards the end of the project versus the beginning. And, um, like we said, there were some, some edits that we decided like, oh, for, you know, character purposes or story purposes, maybe this would work a little bit better than that. So there yeah. were a few pages that I added every once in a while, or, um, you know, there wasn't, I don't think a whole lot of like redrawing of whole pages or anything. Sometimes I would redraw character heads over like a, a few scenes just to bring them back up to style. Yeah. Um, cause I feel like, you know, there was that time period where I was doing uh, Boom Studios comics a lot, uh, and then I stopped that and was doing web comics full time. And then I feel like this was like the first big project I had tackled in a while that like wasn't just me generating my own ideas, and it wasn't a web comic, so it was like the beginning should match the end. It can't have that web comic, uh, sure. you know, skill drift that sort of goes in an upward trajectory. It um, needs to all sort of work together. And I feel like I did actually learn a lot, uh, even during the making of this comic. Um, I felt like I was a, a much better artist by the end of it. And uh, yeah, the beginning needed to reflect that. I feel like those were like the most significant revisions that happened where it's just sort of me being like, Molly looks weird in like the first 50 pages. <laughs> yeah. And so you're just you're just going in and Photoshop at that point and just yeah. making small little edits. Yeah, yeah. I I did um I this was a weird because I I work traditionally a lot uh and I do I do some comics that are totally digital, but I always feel like they feel very different to me than I feel like I'm most comfortable traditionally. Yeah. So it was this weird situation where I was like I was thumbnailing traditionally and then I would pencil digitally and oh, then I would print it out and ink traditionally and then I would uh, scan it and edit it digitally. Uh -huh. And um, so it was a weird sort of back and forth for me to sort of make what I thought was the best, uh, the best pages that I could come up with. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, particularly because of the, if you're thumbnailing physically, then you're still having to scan all those thumbnails in yes. to submit them to your editor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I have, all, regardless of if I do a comic totally digitally or not, I cannot thumbnail digitally. I have to, yeah. I have to thumbnail traditionally no matter what, uh, even for, yeah, like 100% digital comics, they will start. Because I think it's easiest for me to like look at this tiny P, this tiny little square with all like the tiny little heads in it for thumbnail and just yeah. to see the whole page really, really small to like get a, the best understanding of how it should all work together. Uh, and then if I'm on the computer, I like zoom in way too far. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and Gozi, is that relatively true for you as well in terms of your, your working process? Yeah, that's why I was nodding pretty vigorously. Yeah, well, that's uh, why I wanted to just follow up because because yeah, yeah. this will be a podcast version too where no one will be able to see our pictures. Oh, yeah, so podcast, sometimes I have to answer, video. ask questions out loud. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was nodding pretty vigorously because thumbnailing and outlining is something that I like. I write a lot of my scripts in a notebook before I type them up and I thumbnail. Um, in like that same notebook before I take it to the computer. Um, it's just, I don't know, it just feels more visceral, like more physical, like you're, you can see everything at once. You can make edits by crossing them out. There's, and you can just like open it and close it and take it to a coffee shop. I, you can do all that stuff on an iPad, but there's something about working on the page that just feels a bit more organic when you, when it comes to that initial part of storytelling. And and in terms of the actual drawing portion of it, for for either of you, is any of it the the, the tactile feel of of how your pen is going across the page? Yeah, I don't know. Like normally now in my process, I tend to ink and color, um, and then I pen sometimes I pencil a lot on so digitally, yeah. but. Um, 
I don't know. Like, I, I do like being in a sketchbook. I do like drawing, like, on computer paper, which might sound crazy, but there's not, nothing beats a stack of computer paper um, for creativity. So there's just something about just having that white space um, yeah. and, and being at a desk that's that creates a lot of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I think... Um... For me, especially, I feel most comfortable inking traditionally. I feel like I could probably, I don't know, so I just feel like it, it, it doesn't look like something I've drawn truly unless I'm inking it with, like, the pens that I always use, like, at the size that I normally work, um, which uh, for my webcomic, uh, Sakana, is enormous. They're, like, 18 by 12 wow. pages, and it's two comic strips per page. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of, um, even if I, if I like when I'm, when I'm penciling traditionally, I'll like make a lot of lines. Like if I'm drawing the shape of a character's head, like it'll be like maybe six or seven different ovals overlapped on top of each other. But when I'm inking, because I've inked so many pages this way over my you know career I, I'll know exactly like by instinct like which one to pick out to sort of complete uh in the inking stage and I feel like that's that only comes with you know having done like a thousand sure. <laughs> two thousand pages that yeah. way already it's just like this is I could draw this in my sleep at this point especially with uh my webcomic characters who have been around for 15 years Madeline, that actually leads me almost like a question or if I could elicit inking advice from you. Yes. Um, I feel like a lot of people like they you ever hear students or something complain that when they ink something, they they ruin their sketch. Oh, yeah. Know. Yeah. I don't know. If yeah. You have a remedy for that. Well, it definitely, I think that there is always something lost uh, because penciling is so uh, that's okay. penciling is so organic. You know, it it's not like like I said, I'll draw like seven different uh, ovals for a character's head in the pencil stage, uh, and that by its nature will give it a sense of energy that is inevitably lost when you decide which one needs to be the final one. But I would say that. Um, trying to practice inking as fast as possible and like not going really super slow and precise. Um, I think that that's probably the best thing that you can do. You can also, if you have a, a traditional sketchbook, just like a regular sketchbook that you doodle in, uh, switch to pen right away. Uh, never ever draw in pencil, just only ever draw in pen. That will help you learn what lines to make the first time you know over a lot of practice it sort of like forces you to like never be able to edit what you've already put down which i think is sort of the the problem with digital is that you have this power to control z like over and over and over again and so you're never really having to learn how to find the right thing right away you can sort of noodle on it forever do you um do you think of inking as as perfecting the drawing or embellishing the drawing or, or, it, or neither of the above? I think it's I wouldn't say perfecting, I would say finishing. Mm. You're just sort of like putting that final little flourish and then, you know, leaving it go. Uh, I think that perfection in comics is the worst possible thing that you could do <laughs> or try for. I think that uh, perfect is the enemy of done. Perfect is the enemy of ever starting because if there's one thing I've learned in making a comic for 15 years, the first page is going to look a lot different than the last page and you just have to accept that. Yeah. I, I always think of inking as its own type of drawing. Like I think your pencils are almost just like a little bit of a runway and then inking yeah. is just another drawing that's not going to be perfect it's not going to look the way that you might want it to be but and i think i was watching like it was maybe it was mon ben and i saw that there was one mangaka who would just immediately start inking a comic would, wouldn't even have an underdrawing and that really inspired me so um 
Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I would really caution against any young artist out there who's like, ah, inking is where everything is really comes into its yeah. conclusion. Yeah. It's just yeah. making your lines darker. It's really <laughs> okay. So that it scans easier. <laughs> Uh, you're, uh, if you're doing it traditionally, yeah. Yeah. Um, how? Uh, uh, what about the lettering and the coloring on Bunt? Uh, did Did you do that? <laughs> what did you have someone else doing it? Oh my gosh! I yes. feel like this is where we both will like step scratch our heads and go like, like uh, we're yeah. all like pulling our collars because yes. I was supposed to color it, well, and I was supposed to letter it. it. Yeah. But I think what happened. Well, what happened was. We found two people who are very talented to help us finish this project. So we had uh, Karen Chap or Kate Chap uh, come in at the eleventh hour and just do fantastic colors. Like that was a really good collaborative process as well because we were both like, "Okay, how are we going to get this done?" And um, Kay had worked on a book with uh, for Gail Galligan, and Gail really recommended them. And I don't know, it like, I, I really, the colors on this book are lovely. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, yeah, we sort of had, I think for us, it was the first time either of us had ever worked with like a separate colorist that we had contact with. Like for, for Boom Studios, I would finish like an inked page and send it off and then never see it again until it was, I would find it in the store in print. And yeah. it's like, ah, so that's what they did with the colors. Okay. I had like no access to that part of the process whatsoever. But with Kay, um, we just had to have a few meetings with them where it was like, these are the colors we don't like. Uh, I think I like had like a list of like, never use these colors. Uh, these are the colors that we do like. Um, the way that I draw backgrounds is very complicated. So we would like to sort of set up a hierarchy of detail on the color and with the lines where you can sort of bump back lines that are less important, your color hold them, make them a different color uh, and keep the ones that are most important for like form and uh, composition, uh, the darkest. And um, I did like two sample pages or something and then sent them to them and then they did the whole book. <laughs> so nice. it's like, cool. Yeah, and then there were there were very l few revisions. I think I said one time, like, I don't like this character's like lipstick color. Can you please change yeah. it? That was it. <laughs> nice. That's, you've, you've, it's always great when a collaboration works like that, especially if it's at the last hour, the you know the yeah. eleventh hour. Um, uh, and and the lettering, any any particular stories to tell there? I don't think so. Well, um, there yeah, there wasn't any like huge revisions or neat changes needed. Tess Stone did the lettering for our comic. And I have worked with Tess. I mean, Tess lettered all of Check, Please through what, the first, second books, the Macmillan books. Um, that was all Tess's lettering. Um, I think Tess even lettered some of my self-published copies of Check, Please. They're so reliable. And, and they themselves are like, or he's like, he's a completely like, competent extremely talented artist illustrator. in his own right <laughs> same, with, think, same with k yeah they're both like extremely talented cartoonists as well if you see their work you're just like wow like i want to read entire comics that aren't just your coloring but like yeah. i want to see your art as well like oh my goodness so tessa is fantastic but he was just he's always down to letter stuff he, he enjoys it so you saved our butt there yeah nice uh i'm assuming you did your own onomatopoeia and stuff though mad oh yeah yeah i i did uh the um the sound effects and everything yeah. mm -hmm. nice very nice well it's you know it's a fantastic book and it it was fun and funny and and it moved along and it it said things you know like i don't know i we were all very very happy with this yeah. all the staff of the store really really loved this as well um i've gotten nothing but uh but but wonderful notes from from my manager over there who's now nodding her head. Yes, there we are. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, no, everybody everybody really loved it. You guys did a great job. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you guys have anything else that you're thinking about working together on in the future? 
I feel like we have to work together on something else, but yeah. for the moment, time being, we both have so many projects individually. Yeah. Yeah, we, I think we've already sat down and be like, okay, how are we going to reverse engineer the next thing? <laughs> but, um, or, or, you know, what are some ways that we can work together in the future? But yeah, I think Ngozi's got a bunch of DC stuff that you're doing. You're, you're, you just finished up your other graphic novel that you wrote and drew and, um, that's flip. the big Barda. There's another one. Oh, there's another yeah, one there's, there's another okay. one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because Big Bird at least has been solicited, so I, I know that we can talk about it because, it, you know, they've told us that it's coming. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then for me, I'm um, uh, doing something a little uh, bizarre and uh, learning uh, 3D art and uh, Unreal Engine. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, uh, I... for a comics project or for, for something else? Both, I think, in the short term. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Un Unreal Engine. It's a video game engine uh, yep. that's free that you can just sort of put assets in. Uh, and I started noodling around with that and thinking to myself, why doesn't everybody use this for comic backgrounds? You can just set up your own, like, uh, you know, you've got the most complicated bookcase, you know, in the back of a comic instead of trying to figure out how to draw that from 15 different angles, why not just like get a 3D camera <laughs> to, to move around it? But um, yeah, uh, I don't know, I, I, I sort of in the mood to, to try some new stuff, uh, learn some new skills. So I've been trying to figure out, uh, yeah, mod 3D modeling, concept art, stuff like that, just to sort of beef myself up a little bit. Nice. It's beef always up. good for a level up, always good yeah. for a level up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I know the last question I wanted to ask you, Mad, specifically uh, before we go into the wrap up, um, and that's and that's the, uh, the 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 nom de plume. Um, what does that mean? At, at the at the <laughs> Your back. Name. No, uh, I, I, know, I, I, I understand that. Handle. At the back of the book, there's like an ex extensive, not a, a, a not extensive, it's specific. Mad is short for Madeline. And she's yeah. not actually angry, which tells me that that this has come up yes. more than once. Yes. And in fact, in fact, my 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 son, who's who's uh, you know who's who's been doing running the show here, uh, like thought that you might be. What did you say? Like a like a. Okay, Ben doesn't even want to be part of the, the conversation. <laughs> uh, but like, oh, like you know, is she like a Russian angry Russian or something? I don't know. You know. <laughs> Yes. No, I, I have, I have, you know, come upon people who have never me met me in real life, uh, yeah. only know me from my art. And they're like, wow, I really thought you were going to be like an angry man named Rupert. And I was uh -huh. like, no, Matt is short for Madeline. Rupert, uh -huh. is, Rupert was my maiden name. Uh, uh, but I still use Mad Rupert as my um, uh, pen name because I think it's, you know, easy to spell, easy to say. Sure. Um, it is strange to, uh, uh, introduce myself as like, hi, my name is Mad. And they're like, that's not a name. <laughs> it's like, okay, so technically it's Madeline. Um, uh, Ngozi calls me Madeline. My partner calls me Madeline. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Madeline is hard to spell. Uh, uh, there are like five different ways that you can spell the name Madeline. For uh, So for like, you know, business, ease of, ease of search, Google, everything like that. Uh, I just think Mad Rupert is... Yeah. No, 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 that makes it's sense. I, you know, I, I, I was wondering too that if, if part of it was, uh, you know, kind of some of the inherent sexism the comics has. Actually, yeah, that was a little bit of it too. Is yeah. that, um, you know, I don't necessarily uh, identify as, you know, perfectly feminine. So the sort of gender neutrality of the name Mad Rupert yeah. uh, also appeals to me. Yeah, yeah, love it. Well, it's a great. I mean, it's a. It, it's your name, but it's it's, it's great it, is, it is a great handle. pen name. Uh, I, I have to say, so uh, Thank you. it makes okay. me sound powerful, but actually, I'm only four foot eleven. So that's another <laughs> really? thing. Yes, wow. yeah, I'm very small. Uh, it's another wow. thing people say is like, oh, from your name, I expected uh -huh. you to be big. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. so, so you're like an angry leprechaun then, or something? Yeah, like a little itty bitty. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Little goblin. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, I only had to ask because it's in the text yeah, of the book. Yeah, no, so that, that's a good question. 
Um, uh, okay, so so let's let's do the wrap up questions. Those are the same as as the the top questions. The the first one we've kind of started to answer. Is there anything else you guys have coming up that you'd like to plug? Um, um, I'll start. So uh, June fourth of this year, I have my first graphic novel with DC Comics coming out called Barda. It's going to be the free comic book day feature. So if you just can't wait, um, it's going to be one of the free comic book day features, but it's the young adult feature. So if you just can't wait on a free comic book day, go to your local comic book store. You might even go to comic experience and pick up a sample if you want to check it out. And oh, I will also be part of the DC Pride anthology that comes nice. out, I think May 28th. Nice. I have a 10 page short in that that I illustrated and wrote. And next year, I will have another graphic novel out. It has not been announced, but it's really fun. It's um, the first original story that I have written and drawn since Check, Please. And look out for that. Nice. Very good. Very good. Uh, Free Comic Book Day, in case, in case you at home don't know this, well, you should, is the first Saturday of May. It's always the first Saturday of May every year. So that's, that makes it very easy to remember. Um, Matt, do you, is there, what do you want to plug? Uh, well, right now, my uh, webcomic, Sakana, is back from a multi-year hiatus that I took to finish Bunt. Uh, so it is uh, updating again regularly, Tuesdays and Thursdays, at uh, Sakana, S-A-K-A-N-A-comic.com. Uh, and then um, maybe I'll be a game developer in the next year. We'll see. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's interesting. Was, yeah. was there another Sakana when you registered the URL? That you needed uh, to put dash comic at the end of it? Uh, yes, actually, there is one. Uh, I think it's called Sakana No Sadness or something. And it, uh. like, from, like, the year, like, 2001 or something like that. I don't think it's been updated in at least a decade. I did um, not know this. It's always there in the back, in the background of my life. Uh, I think you can still find it if you Google Sakata, but my comic usually comes up first because it's more recent. Uh, but yeah, that is why I could not <laughs> just no, yeah. no, no dash or anything. Also, yeah. it's the Japanese word for fish, which is a very oh. common word. So it's like, it's sort of a silly name for the comic because they work in a fish market. Um, in the characters do. Uh, so like, it's not like an uncommon word in Japanese. Yeah. So only because I'm always I'm always really interested about sort of the differences in working uh, on a schedule where you're updating twice a week. How much work is that relative to doing a serialized comic or or working on a graphic novel? Does that does that make sense as a question? Yeah. Um, well, I think it all depends on like how long it takes me to make certain pages for certain things and what else yeah. I'm doing within that same week. Yeah. So for Sakana, I can, because I've made so many pages, I can do like three or four pages per week yeah. pretty easily. Uh, you know, if I'm not totally distracted out of my mind, but um, for graphic novels, it's sort of like as much as you can possibly get done per week. It's more of, I think a, a sprint than a, than a slow jog, which yeah. is what I would uh, categorize web comics as. Yeah. Very much. I understand. Okay. Well, and then the, the last question, the wrap up question, um, this is a series of interviews that's been going on for quite a long time. I mean, Ngozi, we talked to you, I want to say seven years ago, was it? Maybe it wasn't quite that long, but, uh, we've been, we've, I've been doing this for, uh, we're actually, we're about on July. We'll, we'll start year 10. Of, oh, of congratulations. Doing I know. Isn't that insane? Um, uh, the store itself is 35 years old on, wow. on, on April 1st, but, uh, yeah, the Graphic Novel Club we've been doing for 10 years now, uh, or about to have been done for 10 years. So that's, uh, you know, that's several hundred cartoonists that I have interviewed and and many, many, many hours of interviews. And so we get a lot of people who um, who who watch the show, who want to make comics themselves, uh, and who aren't necessarily sure of their own abilities of their ability to start is, is a lot of the thing I hear too, you know, I don't know how to start it. Um, so if there was a single piece of advice, uh, that you were to give to, you know, particularly to someone young, you know, um, who, who, who wants to try their hand at making comics, but, but doesn't know what to do. 
we'd, we'd love to hear what that piece of advice is. It can be something, you know, physical and practical. It can be something emotional. It can be something spiritual. But, 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 what, but what do you got? What, what's your notion? You, you probably need to take your mute off. If, Would you like to go first, Madeline? Oh, I'll go first. Um, again, I said it before, uh, perfect is the enemy. Perfection is the enemy. Uh, you just have to start. Um, start with something short, manageable, maybe make a 10-page self-contained comic just to see how it, see how it tastes. Because uh, <laughs> he's laughing. Uh, and, you know, see how it feels. To make it sort of like do your best in a you know a safe little uh, ten page environment or something, and then if you like that, uh, do something else that's like twenty five pages, and then maybe a hundred pages, and don't do what I did, which is make a you know eight hundred page comic as your very first thing. Uh, don't do that <laughs> 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 for your own sanity. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would definitely say I would follow that up with, yeah, definitely start small um, and have fun. I think I think a lot of people who have that intimidation of comics, they're like, I, I need to start on my 300 page epic. Yeah. Like, I need to make the next one piece. And it's just like every single comic book artist that you know, and you might know a popular work of theirs, they actually probably had like two or three or four projects before that where they were learning their skills and developing them. And some of those may not like not have seen the light of day. So it sounds it almost sounds strange, but go into comics making stuff that you think might not see the light of day. Just have fun, enjoy that freedom and show it to your friends, but you know, it never has to be published. Yeah. Oh, that, that, I do have one more soundbite, which is uh, you have to make a hundred terrible pages before you can make a hundred okay pages before you can make a hundred good pages. So just get all that out of the way and you won't be able to get it out of the way unless you start, you know, as soon as possible and make the worst comic pages you've ever seen in your life. Uh, just accept that and enjoy it. Have fun making bad art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of that. That is that is wonderful stuff. Well, I you know I really wanna I really I wanna thank you guys for taking the time uh, this afternoon and spending spending some time talking about comics with us. Um, if you will hold on just for a minute, I need to do uh, do a little housekeeping here for the show. Uh, so it's gonna be me, and then we'll come back to you. So hi you at home, um, how are you doing? Is everything okay? I hope everything's okay with you. Um, if if you're sitting there and you're like you're like I don't know what to read, and I know a lot of you think this a lot of the time. Um, how about Bunt? This is a really really good comic. It is it is energetic. It is fun. It is funny. It has real characters. It 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 talks about contemporary issues of making art and and trying to survive in the world and trying to find your path. And it's it's just. This is good stuff. So uh, I thoroughly recommend it. If if you were to buy your copy from us, you'd also get um, a super little cute signed book plate, and and Matt even did little little heads on them too. I I, I love the little the little heads. Um, uh, there's a if you're watching this after the fact, not live. There's um there's a button that should be throughout the whole show that you can just press to do it. Otherwise, something's gonna pop along the bottom of the screen here to um to to tell you where the uh, the, the web store is. So. So buy the book. It's really good. You don't have to buy it from us, but uh, but if you buy it from us, then then that makes life easier. I've got a several thanks I'd like to make. Um, I would like to thank Jordan, my producer, uh, who does a bunch of backstage stuff that none of you see, but none of this would happen without him. Um, I want to thank Ben uh, for running the show and doing the camera work and all that stuff because um, I can't concentrate on more than one thing at a time. Um, I want to thank my staff. Uh, I want to thank Zoe, Kat, and Katie, and Max as well. Um, for being the best staff that a comic book store can have, giving me the freedom to sit here and talk to cartoonists uh, and, and talk about making art. And, and you know, also they, they pick the books half the time. Uh, well, we all vote on them, but, but they're, they're, they're doing the, the first draft of, hey, Brian, this is the book you should read. And they were really right on this one. Um, I want to thank uh, all the members of the club um, because without you being a member of this, then we couldn't 
continue to do this. So you can join. You should join. Joining is really good. Uh, you get a good comic every month with signed book plates and things like that and, uh, and lets us do these interviews. Um, I want to thank especially, though, all the makers of comics, people who make comics, because if it wasn't people like Ngozi and uh and mad right here who made the comics we we couldn't i wouldn't have a store full of comics that i could sell you um and so thank you guys so much for being you and doing what you do and making great comics uh we really 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 appreciate it uh, honest to god thank you for having us thank you yeah, so much no i mean yeah. I, thank you for making the book i you know it i i wouldn't i'm not just i'm not doing it for any reason other than this is good so you, you know. you're too kind. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so oh. much, Comics Experience. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, it's it's my pleasure. Uh, just and just so everybody knows, next uh, month's Adult Club book is uh, Tender by Beth Hetland here. Um, it is uh, it is a piece of body horror, um, but from a feminist point of view, it's a really really fascinating book. Though it's pretty dark, it's really literally the opposite of this book. So um that that'll be really interesting and then our kids club uh which is the next show that's happening uh i think three sundays from now will be unicorn boy by dave roman so that should be a fun conversation because this is this comic is insane this is a literally crazy comic um okay so that's what i got uh thank thank you guys again i mean seriously i i really i i really really appreciate what you do and i i cannot wait to see what's next um and i i hope we get to have you back on the show for a third time uh, in another couple of years, Ngozi, and you again in another couple of years, Mad, because you Hell guys yeah. are great. All right? So, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank All you. Right, see ya. Thank you for watching this episode of the Graphic Novel of the Month Club. If you enjoyed what you were watching, please uh, subscribe and hit that bell up in the top corner. If you enjoyed the books that we're talking about and the creators that we're talking to, every month we pick a brand new book. Uh, the staff votes on it. It's a program that helps keep our store alive, and we'd love to have you as a member. You'll get a new book every month. Just follow that URL at the bottom of the screen.